All right. Welcome. It's a pleasure to greet everyone here at the third of our three decision briefings on the budget. For those of you who are in attendance or listening in for the first time, please go to the town's YouTube channel and listen to the meetings, the previous meetings, where I gave a more complete explanation of the, of the process and also an overview and important context about the town's past use of short-term and long-term debt. In brief, I came into office in an election that represented change, and since that time, I've continued to hear from residents that they need and want to see practices that have changed, particularly with regard to the town's finances. So you will be watching us approach the, uh, the budget process in a, in a little bit of a different way that's been done in the past. We are basing our numbers on a five-year analysis of actual expenditures and revenue, so this is not a typical rollover budget where numbers are just merely adjusted from last year. Instead, we intend it to be a rebuild. So we're using the terms from a military decision briefing and courses of action because we have fundamental decisions in front of us. They're on the table for the town board to consider. And rather than presenting you with a fully baked bud budget, we are hoping to build something that's better, it's more thoughtful, in a more public and transparent way. So um, I want to just remind everyone that this is not a time for public comment. We'll have a public hearing on October 25th. And at that time will be an opportunity to discuss the preliminary budget. The vote on the final budget will be on November 17th. And at this time, I'll turn the floor over to our town comptroller, Beth Greenwood. Okay, just to follow on what the supervisor had said, in case anybody's just here or listening for the first time, uh, when we did a look back, we looked at uh, the past five years. We took the two years prior to COVID, 2018 and 2019, looked at those and then averaged those. We averaged, again, 2020 and 21 during COVID. Um, we did see some differences uh, both up and down based on whether it was pre or during COVID. And then we looked um, holistically at the four years plus halfway through the current year where we were just to see if we were starting to see some trends in uh, various directions. Um, based on that initial analysis, we gave recommendations out to all the department heads uh, and then sat with them each individually to go through what our recommendations were based on what we had seen um, line by line through their budgets. Um, we went through and made adjustments so that the money would actually be allotted into the lines from which it's typically spent or received, depending on whether it was appropriations or revenue, um, working with the department heads on that, and then consolidated it into the budget that you see in front of you. Um, in summary, this budget basically reflects what the department heads feel they need to run their departments with the current level of services that they provide to the town. Um, we took that together, consolidated it for the supervisor to show her where the department heads think they need funding um, for their various departments. Based on that, uh, we set up the process as a decision briefing for the board to work through what the department heads need. And then um, we'll get more into the decision part of it at the end today. But again, just the, the options that we're considering here um, in order to not have significant um, tax hikes, because I don't think anyone wants to have that. Um, there are options to either cut services, to bond for the equipment that's been rolled back into the budget, or to use fund balance to offset the costs of equipment. And we'll discuss those at length at the end. Um, we're going to continue with the last several department heads, again, as we've done in the past, with each department head speaking briefly um, to what they've done over the past year, what they're looking to do over the next year, and then we'll uh, work together to answer any questions about their section of the budget that you might have. So we'll turn that right over to our tax collector. Um, you want to just introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Diane Percy, the receiver of taxes. And um, as far as my budget going forward, it is pretty much staying the same as far as we worked on in our, our meeting with the comptroller. Um, there is a difference um, just in this, the STEP program for my full-time employee, um, part-time employee. Um, I'd like to make sure that it is transparent that everything in the part-timers are staying the same. Um, my department has um, increased with the new change of 
bank accounts, it has been a process <laughs> um, and it is time consuming that the employees are learning and doing quite well on, you know, um, but it is a process more like adding to honestly, they are like bank tellers. <laughs> so that should be looked at, I believe, as far as their um, services to the town um, and providing great customer service to our residents. Um, but otherwise than that, I believe I'm not asking for anything additional or um, we can just do I need to speak to the miscellaneous and yep. contractual? Yep. Oh. So the one uh, the one increase you do see there um, is within the miscellaneous and contractual line, and that was specifically to go towards a, a purchase of a printer that's needed in that office um, so that they have um, reliable printing capabilities. Uh, the only other um, particular increase, um, it doesn't show up in this particular section, but in the shared services, which I know we'd spoken to before, was the increase in postage that we've seen across the board for a number of the departments. Um, so we can speak to that. But other than that, in terms of salaries, we did just uh, honor the current um, collective bargaining agreement for the employees affected in that office. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is the appropriate time. In the past, I don't know if you know that I was split between public works. Mm -hmm. my you still are. We still are. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, to take note to that also. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's I'll I'll say that just so that it gets captured. Um, the uh, the salaries for this office are allocated uh, because they do the uh, collection for the water and sewer um, utility bills as well. So that's why you to see two um, employees um, plus an elected official all under that line. But that's about half of the salary for that office, and the rest of it is allocated across the water and sewer funds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Diane. Yes. Um, talk to me about the new banking system and you're saying it's taking you more time. Is that because of sort of the remote depositing? We're mm -hmm. doing that now in-house as opposed to in the past where you would just put the checks and deposit them. Is that correct? Yes, we now have to scan them and deposit them. So that's taking time. Takes a little more time. It okay. does take a little more time. Um, it's coming along wonderfully, but it is an additional responsibility Mm -hmm. to my staff and myself, to be honest, I meant you're talking about, you know, making sure everything <laughs> balances and not that we didn't before, but entering, capturing, you know, the scanner doesn't always read exactly what the check should be. So, you know, you have to make sure that that is capturing the correct amount. Mm -hmm. you know, now, so there are some banking teller, um, you know, and we're dealing with a large amount of cash too. A lot of residents do pay in cash. So depositing those deposits, you know, with, um, the armor car coming to pick them up now. I mean, there's just just little it's extra new. things. <laughs> takes more time. Takes yes. more time. Yes. So, are you seeing less people coming to your window now and more people paying by mail than I in the say, past? Well, it's been COVID, you know, related for the you know past two years. You know, multiple collections each year. This collection we're just finishing. Um, school collection was really kind of the first collection. I feel like the residents have thought we've been open. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of people coming um, to window again, which is nice to see. I, I think it's always nice to interact with the residents. Um, but the mail is still there too. So that's another process that, you know, um, the staff has to do opening. I don't think people realize that, you know, it's manually open. It's not just in making sure everything goes through. So that's a process too. Um, and then scanning those. So I would say, and then, so the window traffic has been up again. Yeah, back to pre-pandemic levels or not quite? Not quite, I would say no. I think people enjoy the Dropbox and I think they also enjoy, you know, the mail's expensive too to mail, <laughs> you know, so I think that could be why window traffic is also, you know, coming and then they get the receipt right away too, which they're mm -hmm. pleased about. Now, the, the new printer, is this a replacement for a printer that no, you had? I'm not sure. That was a little bit of a miscommunication. Is no. that a printer? Yeah. We, we do that. need it. We don't have a, we do have a printer outside the office, but I don't have one that's working. And Seth kind of looked at ours just recently within the office. I don't know how the expense would be, um, you know, for that, but there's some other large items. I, do. I think we were talking about new chairs, I, you know, in the office too. And that's why we put the money. 
I so there's other things than a print than right. just a printer there. Now in the past that line was eight thousand dollars, then fifteen hundred, and now forty five hundred. Eighty five hundred was, and maybe Janet can help me speak to that because I mean Beth, I'm sorry you weren't here then, <laughs> and um, or Bill, maybe you remember the credit card issue with COVID with the um, credit card for utility payments. Mm -hmm. It was not being charged to the residents. So the town took it. The so hit. that's what that is about. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and then it was taken from that line within my department. Fix that, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that answers that question. That's all I have for right now. Thank you. With our new website services uh, starting next year, is there going to be some sort of online payment option for the taxes in the future? Do we have there is online with there credit is. card. I mean, municipalities can't charge a fee for that. So the service does charge that. And, you know, Chase is actually the same amount as uh, what we're using now, System Z Express Pay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I will, I am looking into adding e-checks, which is also a charge. I mean, we use, I mean, they work well with utility. We all, we all for that through iCloud e-checks. It's a, a fee that's passed on to the resident also, but. Um, we're looking to add that too. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Diane. Last question, Diane. Yes. We're asking all the department heads, do the figures and the amounts in this budget adequately support your department for the coming year? No. Okay. So speak up to me about that. Um, Cause I would just say salary. Salaries, that's all. But I understand. We understand. <laughs> so do you want to elaborate on that? Um, my personal service part-time was decreased during the four, that 4% 4 challenge during um, COVID. Um, right now, I have one part-time employee. And I don't know if it's transparent that she has currently been here since 2015. If she is making, you know, the equivalent, especially with her additional, you know, <laughs> duties with the, I hate to have bank teller, you know, banking teller added to that title because indirectly, I think they are adding some responsibilities to themselves. So that's my only thing is that there hasn't been an increase in her salary in two years, maybe. No, no, sir. Lorraine Noel. No, no. no I know that that's Jackie been discussed in other Jackie. other times, okay. and in other times we've discussed about parity between people and unrepresented and duties that they that they have within town hall, and there, we've made some adjustments to make in the past, if you will, to mm -hmm. make sure that we are having people that are doing either similar tasks or have similar titles have, you know, pay that is. Which I equal. have heard parody. I don't think you can look at one office as opposed to another necessarily saying they have more duties than one or the other. Um, to me, it's kind of an overlook to my office at times, as far as the responsibilities of my staff and myself, as far as the amount that we, of the customer service we have with the residents, um, the interaction with residents, um, and the amount of collections that we have based on warrants that we collect. Usually your office is busy a few months a year, right? During the major well, tax collections. Well, once it collections. starts at the end of August, it goes right through June now with both utility collection ending usually in June for the spring collection, May, June. So quiet times are, you know, summer, but then they roll around, right? August comes quickly <laughs> for school collection. Okay. I don't have anything else. Thank you.
And just for the board's awareness with regard to the banking, all of the departments now um, do have their own check uh, deposit machines. So for example, uh, community programs, um, our department as well, and we're, we're working um, with at the town clerks as well. We, we all have our own check cashing, our you know, depositing machines, and it is similar to the ones you would see in the bank. So anybody who receives checks in now um, across across the town, they're able to make the deposit right then and there. Um, and then with the new Loomis um, pickup that we have, any cash is bundled and put, you know, with a deposit slip in a bag and they come and pick up a couple times a week as well. Um, this was done um, mainly for security for our personnel. Um, and also it's it, it, just in general, you don't want people carrying large amounts of cash and checks out of the town building in their own personal vehicles across town to make deposits. So um, it, it was a security concern on our part for our personnel um, to not have them carrying cash out of the building. So we're able to do that this way. Um, and like anything else, this the new banking system is a learning curve. I will certainly say we've seen that across the departments. It is working well, but it is definitely a process as everybody's been learning it. Beth, can I ask a question? Sure. Just a process. So Diane was saying, she gets a check, she scans it, mm -hmm. and then she has to double check. Everyone, I guess, has to yep. double check, make sure it's scanned the right number. Mm -hmm. And then cash gets bundled for the Loomis pickup. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do people do with the check? That is that Once shredded? the check is scanned, they hold it and make sure that they can verify the deposit. But then it's just like the bank. It's, it's scanned and the image is taken, and then um, we hold the checks for a period, and then it can be destroyed. Okay, moving on to public works. Start with your aid fund section. Sure. You can introduce yourself. And if you want to just talk about kind of overall what you've done and what sure. you're doing, and then we'll go into the sections. Uh, uh, Matt Yetto, I'm the superintendent of water and sewer and engineering for the town. I oversee the uh, engineering department, as well as the water and sewer department for the town. Um, the water and sewer department maintains um, hundreds of miles of water and sewer main throughout the town. They're responsible for, for producing and delivering quality drinking water to our residents and also for treating um, the waste generated from businesses and homes in an efficient and environmentally friendly way um, so that we um, can work within our budget and also um, meet all the constraints of our, any permit that is required to operate our facilities. Uh, Water and Sewer has approximately 20 uh, full-time employees. Um, we have seasonal people that we bring on uh, to do um, summer tasks. Um, and uh, we have a, a water plant, a water treatment plant, a wastewater treatment plant, uh, 19 sewer lift stations, um, three water storage tanks, um, and uh, two water, um, drinking water pumping stations as well. Um, in 2022, we've delivered, um, we, by the end of 2022, we, we will have delivered 1 billion gallons of water to our customers, as well as treated close to 1 billion gallons of water at our treatment plant. Um, every day we're seeing about 3 million gallons that are at our sewer plant. Um, we had... A, we try every year to do water main replacement. Um, this year was a little bit uh, constrained because of the supply chain issues. Um, current pipe delivery times are close to a year in, in some cases. But we were able to do a uh, um, water main replacement project on Shannon Boulevard. And uh, we're also installing water main on Hilltop Road as well. Um, we. We're happy to and, uh, report that we started our water plant uh, modernization project. Uh, we awarded um, the first part, the first contract last month, and the second contract will be awarded at the end of this month. Um, much of the technology that runs our water treatment plant, while it works great, was designed and installed in 1964 or five, if you're lucky. Um, it works really well, but um, materials and, and um, parts and pieces and, and replacement um, components are not available for things that were built before I was born. Uh, so, <laughs> so 
So um, we, we've made a, a concerted effort to modernize our, our system to make it more efficient, um, and but also continue to provide quality uh, treatment to our to the water and, and, and um, reliable delivery to our customers. Um, that project will, be, especially because of, of supply chain issues, will continue on into next year. Some of the some of the components are a year and a half out for for um, delivery. So we'll continue working through that um, and and get what we can done as get get done as we have the materials available. We'll have two separate contracts, two separate contractors working down there. Um, and we're looking forward to, to getting that in, up and running um, before we have any um, further issues. Hopefully that won't have issues with supply chain, but you never know. Um, what else? Uh, we, we've begun replacing water meters in, in the homes and businesses in town. Back 15 years ago, we did all of them at once. Um, I know when they did the, the, water the water meter in my house, it was from the 1920s. And so we sort of waited to get this done. So now we're, we're trying to progress and do, um, do this change throughout the year so that we, we don't get hit at the end of 15 years and have to buy all new ones. So it helps to um, spread the project out and, and the cost. So um, we did uh, well over, we did hundreds of, of meters this year and we look to do the same thing next year as well. Uh, what else did we do? Uh, we did sign a contract with um, a, a, a organization to begin delivering high, uh, organic waste to our uh, wastewater treatment plant to be used to um, gain beneficial um, reuse of, of material to, to generate electricity and um, heating fuel, as well as generate revenue for the, the operation of the plant and to help to, to, to um, fund the upgrades that were, were mandated and recently performed down at the plant. Um, in 2023, we look to continue and, and expand upon the, the project to get it to the full uh, design that it was uh, designed for. Um, elsewhere, we look to um, modernize our mapping that we have for our, our water and sewer crews. We currently use paper maps um, and we're, we're trying to move more towards all digital and using GPS and GIS and other technologies like that. Um, I also oversee the engineering department, which I, which I said, um, a lot of the engineering um, work crosses over to the to the water and sewer department as well. So um, the four individuals that work in in my office and the engineering office also support the water and sewer department. So the technology, uh, the, the mapping, as I mentioned, um, and then um, uh, the um, oversight of the stormwater management program that the town is required to by New York State DEC to maintain, that's taken care of in the engineering office as well. Um, <clears throat> the good news is we, while we have four positions, we have been operating for over a year and a half with three people. I believe that we are very close to um, appointing someone at the end of this month. And I look forward to next year training that person to take over the stormwater management program and to take the, the lead on a lot of the, the mapping initiatives that we have. Um, pulling out a, a 200 scale, 30, 24 by 36 inch map with 35 sheets for each to make up the entire town while the the people who have been working here can tell you exactly which road is on which which sheet um it's not efficient and it's not um user friendly and we just want to get modernized so that's pretty much what we do thank you i just want to add a few things that you do that i think you did not mention so uh matt you did an excellent job helping uh helping me rewrite a grant this year that enabled us to stretch $250,000 uh, to cover three projects instead of just one. You helped uh, engineer, prepare the engineering uh, specs to improve the drainage at Blatnick Park, the Babe Ruth Field. You worked collaboratively with Ray Smith on that, and I really appreciate that because it helped us uh, make improvements at Avon Crest. And um, you've also done an excellent job 
bringing together the planning and building department with water and sewer and highway and the three uh, offices, the three, three departments really working much more closely together to help improve communications internally and also externally to the community. And um, I want to just recognize your leadership and your collaboration, and I appreciate all your work. So thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to just kind of go work our way down. We'll start with the A fund because Matt covers most of the funds with his uh, department. Um, the first section is the 1440 section engineering within the A fund. Page four. Th yeah, thank you. Page four. Uh, if you take a look through there, uh, the only difference really that you see there is that we are honoring the uh, collective bargaining agreement in terms of the salary increase there. Next page. And beyond that, you don't have anything else in the A fund, do you? Uh, was, um, Say again. 81. 81. 81. Sorry, yeah. Eight, oh, yeah. Down to the landfill, all the way to the bottom. Uh, works flipping still. Uh, yep. Page 14. We get down to uh, storm sewers. There's more. 8140 section. Which actually, again, Catch up on my other sheet here. So, was there a reason you went down with uh, diesel and gasoline? Are they being covered on some other lines? No, if lines? you look at the uh, historical, it only went down based on yeah, last year's budget. Historically, though, when you look across, they haven't needed nearly that amount. So, we just adjusted accordingly. Okay. Uh, we go down a little bit to the uh, recycling and transfer section, which is 8160. Next, next block down. That does show a little bit of a decrease, mainly in uh, personal services. We're down to one person working there at this point. Um, so that's reflected in that. Uh, this is one of the sections that I think we need to um, spend some time thinking on considerably. Um, we've done an analysis in our office, and um, in order for this particular service to continue to be offered, we, we really are going to need to make significant adjustments to the costs um, that people pay to use the services. Um, I'll discuss that later when we're in the, in the revenue portion of things, um, but it, it is something that um, I think the, the board needs to, to think about. Anything to add on that one? No, I did something that went to me. Okay. Yep. Hold on. Let me get down there. Okay. The next section would be 8165 landfill maintenance. Which is on page 16. So uh, it, it's come to my attention that one, the uh, force main that is leading or uh, comes from the leachate pump station, there's a pump station at the bottom of the landfill at down by the river that pumps anything that soaks through the landfill, any rainwater, any surface water that happens to get through the cap. It's, it pumps that out and, and it goes to the, to the sanitary sewer collection system so that it doesn't get into the groundwater. That force main on that that leads from that pump that goes from the pump to the to the sewer in, out on River Road, starting to show signs that it needs to be cleaned. We cleaned it about ten years ago, and it, at a cost of about six thousand dollars. I re recently asked the company again that did the work how much it would cost, and they gave me a price of thirty five thousand dollars to do it. Which I said no, thank you. We'll find alternate options, um, but when the alternate option came back around $20,000 to to clean the line. So yeah. we're looking for possible solutions of maybe, because the issue is the technology requires a large amount of um, 
it uses uh, ice slurry to clean the line. And to do that, um, you need to buy a, basically a truckload of ice as part of the process. And the company that they went from using a small truck to a large truck. So we would only need about a quarter of the, the volume of ice. So if I can find another local municipality that wants to do this type of work, we could share the cost and it would be a savings. So worst case, we'd have to go back to the uh, more traditional method of using basically foam, they're called pigs, that you used to push through the line. Um, but that's still $20,000. So I'm trying to find an option, other options that are cheaper. And I didn't know if there's any money that was not spent this year that we could, any way we could put that into reserve to use for next year. The problem with that, with the leachate pump station, which is under, covered under landfill maintenance, when it's working fine, it doesn't cost us a lot of money. And then there are certain upgrades and or repairs that need to take place, but because the budget lines are so small and the equipment, it, but the, the work is very infrequent, like I said, 10 years ago or so when we did the work. So can't carry that every year through the budget, so. How big is that line? It's only a, I think it's a two and a half inch PVC line. But it, the, 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 when we, were, because you can start seeing the head, head loss and the, the pumps are starting to work harder than they need. So we're using more electricity. So over time that will get more, it's basically like arteries getting clogged. Over time that's, the film builds up and then if you clean it, then the pump station runs more efficiently and you use less electricity. But I don't want to get to the point where it's so bad that it becomes an issue and we damage our pumps. So it could, it's something that could be done next year. Uh, it's not something that has to be done immediately, but if there's any way to plan for it. Okay. And then I'll, I'll, I'll continue to look for more cost effective options, but it's just it's worst case. Last time you did it was $6,000. Now it's 20. They sold their small 30. truck. Yeah. So if we, they, they said we're, that that cost is for a full truck. If we can find someone else that wants to benefit from us, because they have to come from New Jersey to do the work. So anyone in the capital district. So I'm reaching out to the other municipalities that would would have this need. We last time we we partnered with Schenectady, and they they worked with us on that. Okay, that takes us out of the A fund. We'll skip over the highway fund and we'll get down to the first of the sewer funds. Sewer one starts on page 29. So you'll see throughout uh, the sewer funds and the water fund, um, the 1,000 lines, so the, the cost of um, employees has gone up in accordance with the uh, associated union contracts on that. Overall, uh, the administration uh, decreased slightly for this fund based on what we thought we were going to need. So if we go down a little bit to the collection systems portion You'll see an increase there because this is where we've rolled equipment back into the budget and those 2,000 lines um, that you've seen across the budget now. Uh, for this one, um, this is a portion of the closed circuit TV truck and uh, which is allocated across uh, both sewer funds and the water fund as well as a 10 wheel dump truck which is also allocated across the three funds proportionally. So the reason you're showing those bigger numbers, as we discussed before, with highway is to not bond and to put some of these figures Correct. in the budget now. Right. So this is traditionally each year where the all the uh, costs of equipment for highway, parks, water, sewer were being um, used in short term uh, bond anticipation notes about two million dollars worth each year. Uh, which we've then been rolling, this is actually pushing all those costs back into the budget so that it's uh, more visible as we work through things. Um, treatment and disposal. 
of the city connections line, you'll see an increase there um, per the agreement that we have with the city. Uh, those costs increased in accordance with CPI. Um, given what we've seen this year, I put an 8% increase on that. Um, I think that's probably going to be fairly accurate. And then we see employee benefits at the bottom. You'll see also at the bottom with the interfund transfers, we're no longer going to be transferring uh, a portion over to sewer six. Um, that's the hearing that we had. And now that's on for resolution of moving those properties uh, that had been kind of wrongly allocated since about 1978 that were considered still part of sewer one, even though they'd been part of sewer six actual in terms of operations since then. So we're able to take that particular line out of here going forward once those properties have been properly accounted for. Does anyone have any questions about the sewer one appropriations? Okay, we will move on down to sewer six. Oh, one thing I do wanna mention, sorry, as I'm scrolling past my page, um, one of the things we've been working on um, that will be particularly visible with sewer one, um, we are correctly allocating um, what portion of the sewer bill goes on to the tax bill, which is only the capital expenditures. So any payment of debt, whether it's for the water or the sewer bills, they'll be on the tax bill and everything that comprises the operations and maintenance will be part of the utility bill. Um, that is in accordance with New York state law and also our own town zoning code. Uh, we have not been doing that completely. And so we are adjusting accordingly with this budget um, this will be particularly obvious for the folks in sewer one because they have never received a sewer utility before. They, their operations and maintenance as well as their capital debt has always been just commingled and put on their tax bill. So it will look different to people and we just wanna make sure that everybody's aware of that. The cumulative amount will, will be as though it were before, but it will just be broken apart. So the capital debt is the only thing they'll see on their tax bill. So it'll look like they suddenly are paying far less on their tax bill, which everyone will rejoice greatly until they then get their utility bill, which is the portion that had previously been on their tax bill. So I don't want anyone to suddenly think we've forgotten to bill them appropriately. We will certainly do that correctly, but I just want them to be aware that it will be broken up. They've always gotten a utility bill with their water bill on it, but this will now have both their water and sewer on it. We will be putting forth a lot of information on what people can expect to see as we go forward so that we don't surprise people. All right, going down to sewer six appropriations. Again, with the personal services lines, you're seeing us um, keeping up with the contractual obligations. There wasn't much other change to the administration there. Um, going down into the collections portion, um, you'll see a portion of the uh, closed circuit television truck here in the sewer six line where that's been allocated. There were some other small increases through that portion, but nothing significant. Moving down to the treatment and disposal, that's where you'll see the allocation of the 10 wheel dump truck in that 2000 line. Hmm? It doesn't. Would you prefer to have it in the other 2000 line? Yeah, that should be used for the ministries. Okay. I can just shift it back up yeah. then to collection systems. I wasn't sure whether you wanted it in collection systems or in treatment and disposal. I wasn't sure if it was going to be used for sludge or for, no. no. Okay. I will just move it up. Yep. Yeah, I'll make a note for myself. Thank you. All right. Let's see. It's 8132,000. Oh, to the right. 
find the beautiful. Okay, let's move that up to collections. Okay, thank you for that. So, Beth, will that zero out that 2,000 line and move the entire amount up it to will. collections? We'll just take that entire amount and shift it up to collections. Okay. I didn't realize. I thought that was more for sludge, and it's not. So we'll get it into the right section of the budget. Uh, you'll see there was a decrease um, significantly down in the 4520 line, the engineering services. Um, that reflects the contract that was signed in 2021, dropping the cost of those services down to $75,000. Do you have anything else on this one? Okay. All right, and that rounds out sewer six with the employee benefits at the bottom and the existing debt for that particular fund. All right. And we can head on down, skip. Should some of these costs get shifted, it's a little unusual. I mean, with state retirement, 105, 83, 109, 141, back to 112, or is that just due to different retirements and staffing changes? It is, and we get those bills ahead of time, and it, uh, part of it's based on how the fund is doing at the state level, part of it's based on who's retired and you know what tier we have people um, working in and so forth. So those, those are not numbers that we get to pick. We are given those. Okay, thank you. Okay, going down to the water fund, which you'll see on page 41. Oh, oh sorry, it would help if I started with the, wait a second. I got my stapled out of order, that's my trouble. Okay, there we are. 38 would be a better place to start. Starting again with administration, um, the personnel costs are based on the union contracts. There wasn't much other change through the administration, just some slight adjustments on which lines the monies were coming from. Okay, source of supply for water one. Actually decreased a little bit based on our, our what we've seen for trends. For the purification section, you will see a significant increase that mainly has to do with the cost of chemicals, particularly chlorine. Uh, we've been hard pressed this year to keep up with those increases. Uh, we tried to put a little bit of cushion in there. I'm not even sure if that's gonna end up being cushion with the continued increases. That, that's something we're gonna take one more look at uh, before we um, finalize um, our adjustments for the next round with the mm -hmm. preliminary budget. It had to double it from last year, yeah. that's substantial. Yes, it is. And you're, not, and you're not even sure that's gonna cover it. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's that bad, so. Okay, uh, going down to transmission and distribution. Again, um, the cost of uh, salary is commensurate with the bargaining agreement. When you get here to the 2000 line, for the equipment on this one, that includes a 12 inch pipe, about 3000 feet on River Road and the portion of the dump truck that was allocated that goes into the water fund. Did you wanna to speak to that River Road section? Sure. Uh, long term, my plan is to start whittling away at the 12 inch water main that's on River Road. It's a, a large diameter main uh, from, for our standards and it, it, it supplies water to um, a, a large group of, of heavy users. The, the GE and Capital are, are heavy consumers of our water as well as uh, certain neighborhoods along River Road. The problem with that line is when it does break, um, the traffic impacts are much greater than if it were just a small break on a residential 
side road. So that in the labor cost increases substantially because we have to have everyone out there flagging and, and, and at night and lighting and everything. It's, it's much more difficult, but it's a, it's a line that breaks quite often, unfortunately. Um, the soil types and the type of con con construction that took place in, in back in the 60s when they installed the line. Um, it's just the, the pipe is in less, less than ideal shape, we'll say. Um, so I'd like to start starting at the circle and heading towards um, uh, Rosendale Road, start replacing that line. And I wish I could say it used to be a mile, a million dollars a mile for water main. It's not that any longer. So I would just try to maximize the amount of money that I have in, in, in budgeted for water main and just keep moving towards that goal and, and pick a section and move and, and, and replace that as we go. And if I can pick up smaller areas in, in more um, hot spots, if you would say in it for certain roads, we'll replace, make those replacements as well. But if we don't start replacing that 12 inch now, I, I can see that being an issue. I mean, we have anywhere from probably five to 10 breaks on that line a year. And it's, it's just impactful. I mean, we've had two of just in the last few months right in front of Botanic Park. So I'd like to try to get that taken care of. And then just long-term planning and re replacing key lines and then and then going to the hot spots. So uh, I have some money that I didn't spend this year that I would use the pull, uh, pull and use that to, to maximize the amount of pipe that we could replace. <clears throat> Matt, just to speak to that, I, I, I've seen for myself the impact on residents when this pipe continually breaks. So I'm glad you're focusing on it. And to speak to traffic, the school buses can't even get to school on the days where there's certain breaks. Will you be, so you're going to be looking at like residential neighborhoods and where the severity is to kind of... Yeah, so we have a sort of a running list of areas that have breaks. So if it's one break in, an, in, in one area and it doesn't happen again for 20 years, we don't worry, you know, it's not on our top of our list, but it, certain areas where we keep going back and replacing lines. And that's how we choose our, our, our Shannon Boulevard, like I mentioned mm -hmm. this year, that was one that was installed in the 1990s, but the soil conditions and the type of pipe used, that, that would break quite often. Uh, Mohawk Road was another big one. Um, and even there's a couple sections along Route 7 too, which, but I'd rather focus on some of the, the more attainable goals because working in New York State right away is even that more expensive and more challenging. So um, pick the, the, the projects that we can handle. And um, and then we did do a, apply for some grant money. So if the grant money does come in, we could do, hit, do our wish list. But um, just, I have a list I can share it with you afterwards, if you like, of, of my wish list. But River Road mm -hmm. is highest in my priority right now. I was wondering the GPS, and I think you said GPI systems you talked about before, if there's a situation and like the roads are stopped, you know, closed and people are, you know, their homes are getting destroyed and things like that. Would those systems help you more Would help. quickly address? Um, it, any, anything more accurate mapping is, is always helpful. If you're, mm -hmm. if you have a foot of snow on the ground and you can find the valve that you need to turn off to control a situation, if you have it adequately, Located, absolutely. Having accurate mapping is is key. Um, I can't rely on the people who've been here for 20 years so they can tell you exactly where that valve is because they've, they've turned it before. You have to look forward and you don't want to lose all that knowledge. And that helps capturing that knowledge as well, using the GPS with the people that are knowledgeable as well. Right. So half an hour in an office to look at a paper map might not seem like a big deal, but it's a big deal when people's homes are getting I, I've been affected. I've been in firsthand watching yes. Mohawk Road run like a river and not being able to get the valve off because we couldn't find it. Yeah. Now having all that information, which we have mapped that all well. So it's, it's beneficial. Yes. Thanks. We're continuing to spend the money that we need to, to do the replacements in infrastructure. Hopefully with the new federal legislation, we'll be getting some money. We're hopeful to continue on. Matt, Matt is very aware of where, we need to put our attentions, and we've done that. Mohawk Road, perfect example, right? And now you're thinking about 
River Road. Again, we continue to replace as we can with the money that we have available to try to work on our infrastructure. Right. It's not sexy because nobody sees it. It's all underground, right? Yeah. Nobody sees it. But when it doesn't work and it breaks, yeah. then it's a problem. That's why it was so important last night that we uh, passed that resolution to hire a grant writer who will be focusing on two major initiatives is water, infrastructure, and pedestrian crossing, improving walkability. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. All right, scrolling down a little further through that section, um, we're addressing some of the meter issues. Um, we're, we're changing the names of a couple lines. So 4660, we're changing it to uh, what's gonna be called in-house meters. And those were the meters that Matt was speaking to earlier where we're going back through and intentionally um, keeping those up to date and installing them as they need. Um, and the next one down is called new build meters. That is actually offset by revenue um, so that, that actually has a line that it balances with on the revenue side. So that's for any new construction that comes in when the builders um, build those new properties, they actually buy the meters from the town so that, that it's a, a, a net zero for the town um, when those are initially installed. So the line for in-house meters, as you said, is up substantially. So is that a material and labor number, or is that just a material number for meters? That's just a material number down there. The labor is accounted for up above in the personal services line. Okay. Um, what, what Matt has been doing in there, uh, you probably speak to this better than I do, but they, they basically are rebuilding a lot of the meters. So. Yeah, Why don't so, you speak to a little bit about sure. that? So um, our water meter um, technician, uh, John Jackson, I'll name, name John. Uh, he's been able to take some of the meters, back, most of the meters that come back off the system and the, 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 the brass. So the, the bodies, we were able to remove the, the internals, replace them with a, with a um, calibrated monitoring unit and then put it back into service rather than buy a, an entirely new meter. So that little bit of labor, especially over the winter when we have some, some time to catch up on things, we can save um, money instead of buying an entirely new meter so that stretches it even further. And how are we going about deciding which houses we're doing, which neighborhoods, that sort of thing? So we work with the, the manufacturer of the meter company, uh, the metering company. Um, they have a software package that we can look at the total volume through a meter and the age and look at um, once you know, once you get a certain amount of water through a specific type of meter, it, you, you lose efficiency. So that's the time to replace it. So that we're using that, and we started with our largest meters because the large meters use the most water and they wear out fastest. And the return on investment is much greater on those as well. If you have a meter that's running 5% slow and you're in a million gallons a year through it, or a small residential meter, you, you, the, the payback's much faster on the larger meter. So we're doing that. We started with that, and then we're starting with the the uh, the the residential meters that have had a large flow through them, or if they have an issue and the meter has to be replaced, we rebuild that and put that back, the new meter back into the system. Right, and you do it if you, if we're trying to read the meters, let's say we're trying to read the residential meters and you're not getting, getting a reading on a certain meter, mm -hmm. that town employee then might try to reach that homeowner either by knocking on the door. If they don't get an answer, they may leave a door tag there to try to get a hold of them and let them know that there is a problem with their water meter, it may be on an estimated reading, and that we would like to try to address that in their property. And we have to coordinate that with that homeowner, right? Yes. Yeah, and, in, and that's why doing it on an ongoing basis is more, more efficient than we, when we changed our meters back in 15 years ago, we hired a company and we, we spent a large amount of money and quite a bit of time just to get access into the homes. And if we have, if we happen to be there and, and someone's there and they're willing to let us in and we can take care of the issue, then um, it's much more efficient and, it, and it, it saves trying to make that person then take another day off of work. If they happen to be home and they're willing to allow the town, you know, fully identified town uh, employee and they can even call the office if they have any questions, if they question if this, if this the guy's legit that's here. Um, so. It, 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 it's a, John has taken a very active role in this and I'm very happy with his, his, his work. 
So I want to keep giving him the the materials he needs to keep going. So that's that's why that that number is a little bit higher. Uh, and another reason it was a little higher is there was a lot less of this the last couple of years over COVID. So we're trying to to kind of get ahead on it again. So that's another reason for the boost. Okay, uh, we go down through the water. Um, we have the employee benefits and then just the debt service. Was there, there some sort of typo on that line for 8,000 in employee benefits? Which line? I got on social security, I got pound REF exclamation point. Oh. It looks uh, like an error with the spreadsheet. It must probably. be an error on that spreadsheet. I apologize. Which which the line? Number is 88,493. Okay, that was the previous year, and we've budgeted 90,000 uh, for 2023. Sorry, it must have printed funny. It's Sorry, it was. Value is yep, for the previous and the current year is 656,957, which is an increase of $12,283. Thank you. Yep, the awesome. Social Thank Security you. line was 88,493. And then the budgeted is 90. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry about that. Okay. And that takes us through the water uh, appropriations. Is it any questions? Are we going to be so we're going to be handling revenues just I've got those at the end. On their own at the end, right? Okay. You good? Matt, one more question. Okay. Do the figures in this budget adequately fund your department for the coming year? If we can figure out the uh, the force main with the, on the leachate pump station, yes. Okay. Which I, I'm sure we can figure something out. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was supposed to let the town clerk know when we were getting close. She yes. Me. Why she, don't we take a, me, so I just text a two to three minute break? Thanks. I know that might actually only use a restroom. <laughs> I'm like, I needed the coffee, and now I'm like, <sighs> yeah, I got. <laughs> uh, Frank made me the. No. So I made you the pump. Somebody, somebody made me my pumpkin coffee again. Oh, oh. it was another treat. I'll be right back. I'm going to get the restroom. I am too. Okay. I actually want to see if my water bottle is.
That's what I'm like. I'm. I didn't know that. Thanks, Matt. How many more departments do we have? So far, it's one. Michelle and you. Mm -hmm. yeah, kind of for mm -hmm. If you want this, this is for you. If you want it, if you want some light reading, bedtime reading. I don't reading. think you'll need it. Okay, thank you. Sorry for making you wait, Miss Martinelli. Okay. Uh, this uh, we're going to start with section back up to the top in the A fund, page two. It's section fourteen ten, but I will first turn it over to the town clerk to speak. Okay. okay. I'm Michelle Martinelli, town clerk. I gave you a handout of some things, but first I'm gonna go over everything that we do in our office. Currently, the town clerk's office has over 200,000 vital records in our office, which increases each year with more deaths, more births, more marriages. And this is takes quite an enormous amount of time for our staff to maintain this. In addition to our vital statistics, or vital records, um, we take care of dog licensing, dog park permits, disability tags. You can see I do have charts there for the um, dog licensing and how it's gone up and down. We did have an increase when we did do the, um, the enumeration for the dogs. That right, we had sort of a major initiation yeah, on yeah, it back in 2020. to license your dogs, yep. Um, disability tags takes quite a long, quite a, a big amount of time. And you can see where um, I do have a chart in there that how it's increasing and it does take a lot of time. We um, issue garbage hauler permits vending permits, plumber's registration, hunting, fishing, um, receiving all the suits and claims come through my office uh, for the town, um, record management and inventory control of that, those records are done in our office. Block party permits, notaries, 
have increased over the years um, due to the fact that a lot of banks don't have notaries anymore. So a lot of our residents do come to us for that service. Um, yard waste collection, the bills, um, the amount of time that it takes cannot be overstated. It includes all residents, residential properties, and it's an, or, an enormous undertaking between payments, opt-outs, opt-ins, people change their mind, they want to opt back in. Um, it's, <laughs> it's quite a undertaking. And we have to report all these um, with great accuracy to the highway department so that they know who to pick up, what house wants the yard waste, what yard uh, does not want the service. And we do assist other departments, the building department, we process all their deposits for their permits, the funds. We process highway permits, alarm payments um, from the police department, vehicle impounds, transfer center, we issue annual permits, three days, punch cards. Um, we also work with the APF on stray dogs. Our police officers pick them up, bring them down to APF, and we process the dogs. And bid openings. I do um, help each department head who has a bid opening. I help them with that. We also field calls for the highway department issues, um, town resident concerns about just about anything. The city of Schenectady um, calls us often because people are confused. Was I born? Were I, they are not sure if they were born in Schenectady or Niskuna at Bellevue. Um, we field a lot of calls for the department um, for um, board of election calls, especially around election time, and um, calls for the tax collector because sometimes they think that's what I do, or they get our offices confused sometimes. We also um, administer oaths of office, not just to people at a town hall. We also do it for the um, fire departments. We prepare minutes for every board meet, town board meeting. We facilitate the FOILs, I'm the FOIL officer, and also the CO searches that go through the building department. And we also maintain the postage machine that's upstairs for town hall. So with that being said, you saw the charts that I gave you. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go over our accomplishments from last year. We created an online um, opt-out system for yard waste. So now residents can just go online to their computers and just opt out. That was um, great help that Seth, he was a great help with that. We streamlined the pr uh, process for um, getting a marriage license for town residents. Together with the police department, we streamlined the task of processing alarm bills. We continue to issue over 2,000 vital records, which include birth certificates and death certificates. We added to the safety of the town clerk's office by enclosing the front counter. We worked with Donegan Systems for the proposal for a redesign of inactive records stored in the records room in the basement of town hall. And I did give you the um, printout for that proposal, which we are going to hopefully get a grant for. And I look forward to working with the grant writer on that. Um, we changed banks and integrated the new banking system into the clerk's office. It was a little cumbersome at first, but we have really streamlined that process and it's working quite well for us. Um, we entered over 15 years of marriage licenses into laser fiche. And this is uh, cr critical due to the increase of requests um, because of the real ID. A lot of married women have to obtain their marriage licenses in order to get the real ID with motor vehicles. 
And by putting them in laser fiche, we're able to retrieve them quicker. Our goals for 2023, obtain a grant for inactive records, integrate an online payment for all to, into our new bank, bank. So all online payments I would like to have done through our new bank. So hopefully that'll work. Provide online dog license payments. Work with the police department to accept online payments for alarm fees. Work with the police department also to find placement for dangerous dogs. That's kind of been an ongoing thing. Hopefully we can achieve that. Continue a high level of customer service provided to our residents of the town in Eskiuna and also to the hundreds of residents that request birth certificates, death certificates, and marriage certificates. Continue to input marriage licenses prior to 1985 into Laserfish and provide quality assistance to all departments of the town in Eskiuna as we always do. Due to the high volume of work on a daily basis, organization is a must and is an ongoing task. We take pride in the way we have accomplished this, but most continually must always be continually worked on. Do you have any questions? Michelle, didn't we get some new storage for your offices up here? We did. Um, yes. Back before COVID, Donegan Systems also did a storage um, system, filing system for my office, and it just about tripled, if not more, my It was storage. much smaller than this system. It here, is, correct? yes. And the, um, I think it was like around 15,000, and the town board at that time graciously gave us the money for that. So that's why hopefully that'll help with the grant too. Right. That so by doing that, may, hopefully we may be able to get a grant because this is really the archived yes. stuff that you're trying to get done. In and the we're running out of room and this will give us more room. It'll increase the storage. Right. Thank you. And Michelle, the security of it too. Sorry. Sorry. When, um, Birth and death certificates come to you. Do they come electronically or are they? Um, the birth certificates come to us from Bellevue Hospital daily, and it's not electronically. Um, we, um, I sign them. We give them all a number. Then we electronically put them into our system, and those um, then get sent to Albany. The Death certificates come electronically. That's been a big thing that's saved everybody a lot of time in so the past, probably since a couple years before COVID. Okay, yeah. So when someone requests a birth certificate, you have to find it on your online system that's been so we, in. So um, it's all filed in Laserfiche. We pull up the date of birth or the date of death. The certificate comes up and we print it out. Okay. I'm just wondering, um, you mentioned that you, for security, closed off part of the, the front window there. Mm -hmm. um, I was here one day and somebody was very agitated. I think you probably remember. And it happens, yeah. They were very upset because at times people need that birth certificate or death certificate for maybe SSI benefits or for family court. Mm -hmm. um, so I could see why they would be really agitated, but I also saw the effect on our town hall employees having yeah. someone who was really upset here and like yelling and you know yeah. like very very it, upset. It, yeah, it does. They were having a hard time, and sometimes. that was you know we all understand that. And happens. there are certain things that we have to follow because of the state and what we're required to ask of them to show proof that they're who they are trying to get this because we can't just hand a birth certificate out to anybody. Right. So, is there? Do you think you'll be going back to? if they have the right ID, being able to just provide that to someone immediately if they come with their ID and they, they need something for like an immediate reason? Um, we found the system that we're working with right now through mail or dropping it in the Dropbox works quite well and um, possibly not. 
I'm not sure. It depends on. Um, yeah, because remember this we, woman was we upset. It would wait. She had to wait for something to come in the mail for days when she needed yeah. it. Yeah. Well, usually they get it within a day or so. The mail has improved quite a bit. Thanks. Michelle, you mentioned that birth certificates come in from Bellevue Hospital daily. Yeah. Yes. Do you know on average uh, how many? Like every other day. Do you know on average how many you get at a time? Oh. Um, I'm sure it varies. Yeah, it varies. Um, yesterday we got about 25. Sometimes there could be about. 40, if not more, and and each one of those have to be manually put into your system by your staff. Yes, yep, and I have to sign all of them. And it's not just sometimes the birth certificate that comes. Um, we also might get an acknowledgement of parentage too. That's if the parents aren't married, they acknowledge that they are the parents of that child. So that's just another piece of the whole thing that has to be put in. So that doubles what we get. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize it was that many every couple of days. Yeah. It's a lot. Thank you. Yep. Michelle, one other question. Um, you talked about changing over to the banks and the integrated new banking system, the check readers, how, and you're finding that's working well for your department? It is. We have a really good system going. Um, you know, it took, you know, a couple of days to get it like tweaked and everything, but we're fine. Yeah. It's, everything's going well. Yeah. And it's great to have. The cash actually picked up. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. And just to look at the lines, you can see uh, fourteen ten is the first section. It's on page uh, three. Do you have any questions on that section? I just see that uh, equipment, capital outlay, zero. Um, service on equipment, zero. Mm -hmm. Is that a safe estimate? Yeah, the, that equipment outlay is just for capital equipment, and that's, um, that's in a different section uh, is where we put the money for the uh, storage. Yeah, it, that's down in the records management section, but yes. Okay, scroll down here. Records management, section 1460 on the following page. So that's where you'll see the $40,000 there. That is the amount allotted for uh, the storage, but that is offset on the revenue side. Um, so it's a zero, zero balance for the town. Um, that work would only be done if there were actually the grant money received for that. So this proposal here we got, I thought, let me go back. I thought the numbers were like 75. Is that, did I read that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So our plan was to look at doing that over a two-year period with the grant. It was 78. <sighs> There is page, I don't know what page it is. Anyway, so it's about $76,000. Mm -hmm. um, and did you talk to them about doing it in steps yes, or? Definitely steps, yeah. You did? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we could do 40 and 35, whatever. This is for the entire thing, correct? Yeah, the way the room is down there, we would do one half and then do the other half. It's, okay. It's quite a bit down there. And we're applying for a grant. We don't have a grant yet. Correct. Okay. All I right. can't start to apply for that one until a couple months, maybe the end of November, December, I think. Yeah. I think so. so I guess that's my question. Is it our intention then to do this and spend this money because we're showing $40,000 here in this budget? Or is it our intention to wait for the grant? So I have $40,000 in this portion as an expenditure and I have 40000 in a revenue. So our intention was not to spend the money unless we got the grant to match it. So that's why it balances net zero across the budget between the appropriations and the revenues. It okay. is something that we do need to do, but we think that we have a very good chance of getting the grant, which is why we didn't want to show it as truly an outflow from the town. 
I don't have we I don't recall ever doing that in the past. So you, do, you know, showing an expense and a, then a possible grant as a revenue. Right. I, I, maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't you know, recall Michelle, ever I had doing a conversation that. Conversation about this that she wasn't intending to do this this year unless she got the grant, which is why we balanced it out. If it's something that was going to be done and we didn't weren't applying for a grant or or we're going to do it regardless of whether we got the grant, then you wouldn't necessarily see it balanced on the revenue side. Right. That's but what we, we did. We, we did the revenue. system up here. Correct. Correct. We didn't get a grant for this. We system. paid for this system here. You right. needed it. Yes, but I think we have a good chance of getting this grant. I think it's important that we do. We haven't gotten a grant for records management since um, Helen Kopke was here. Okay. That was the clerk before me. Basically, by netting it out across the, the expenditures and the revenues, we aren't raising any tax money for it if it's something we're only going to do if we get a grant. Yeah, I just um, I just haven't ever seen it that we've done it like that before. Yep. Okay. Uh, yes. What number? Uh, page eight. Okay, if you'd like to go down to section 4020, so the Registrar of Vital Statistics, that's the next section. And that had very, uh, very little change. The registrar for the personnel services, this is a full-time position? Those positions for, for the department are all allocated across the multiple segments of the budget. So, how many different departments do we have? Between town clerk right. and register? Yes. Anything else? How is it? How is it? Records management. Records management. I think that's yeah. Let me check on that. I, I'm yeah. checking before I say that. I just had a question. Do you have it? Is it allocated that it's someone's job to do the vital statistics? Kind of like yeah, separated until like Michelle different. Michelle Zurich and I are allocated to do that. That's where the salary there is. Okay. And then <laughs> yeah, I'm the registrar. She's the deputy registrar. Okay. Which are official titles they that are, carry certain have, duties with them. Yeah, I right. have to have a deputy clerk and a deputy registrar. Gotcha. Did not, but it's within the same fund, so it doesn't really. Okay, I just. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Okay. So, you know. okay, any other questions? Postage. Did I miss postage in your department? Yeah, I so I um, manage the postage machine, and postage has gone way up. <laughs> right. So we've seen it allocated for other departments, but I didn't see it in your in any of the lines for you. Did no, I did I actually, miss it somewhere? It's actually so yeah. Shared services. Yeah. Okay. And I have. Um, I think we went over shared services on day one. Yeah, we did. I'm just making sure I'm paying attention because I know that it went mm -hmm. up in the receiver of taxes spoke about it and then I wanted to. Right. It's um, not in her line though either. No. Shared line. I do have a report that breaks down each department and what they spend in postage. And I can provide that to you if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. 
And the postage is in the shared services section. It's not in the receiver of taxes or the, you know, each department doesn't have their own line for postage. It's just a, com it's a consolidated expense. Okay, any other questions? Last one, Michelle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Do the figures in this budget adequately support your department for the coming year? When it comes to supplies, training, legal, that, yes. Um, the only thing I have concerned about, concerns about is salary. Based on what I explained to you, what our office does, it covers a lot of things for the town. And um, when it comes to my deputy clerk too, is not getting paid what she should be paid. I mean, a 40 cent increase is not sufficient. That's what she got last time. She is not making near what part-time people make and she's doing so much more in three days than some people are doing in other offices. It's just not, not oh. enough. Okay. So no, I appreciate really your candidness. Something that has to hopefully increases her salary. Well, I think that's a conversation that you, the supervisor and controller should have. Again, we've talked about this before, parity amongst people, you know, that work here in unrepresented classes and that. And so. So you I, can't really do a parity with a full-time office compared to people are, that are doing seasonal work. That's my opinion. I appreciate that. Okay. Again, I appreciate your candor. Okay. So I think those discussions should continue. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank Michelle. You. All right, now I get to the fun side of the budget. Hmm? Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. We had not included the historian to be able to speak, and I would like to do that if we could just take one minute. Okay, I will review his for him. Thank you. He's right um, here. He's right there. Do you want to come up and sit? Okay, fantastic. I'm sorry, say again the page? Page 12. Page 12. He's down a little bit. I got to scroll here. It's the only problem. I don't have pages on my spreadsheet. Oh, there we are. 7510. All right. Um, as a general rule, the historian does not ask for much. And so not much has changed. Um, but there has been a small change that we did want to address. And I thought it was important that we actually mention it. Let's see. Go. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the one increase you'll see there is in the miscellaneous and contractual line. And the reason for that was to contract a graphic designer for the new logo that's being worked on. And I will let him speak to that. Uh, yes, one of the projects we're working on, and I, I guess I'd like to say, I'll blow my own horn a little bit here. I think over the last few years, um, the myself and the committee have, have uh, done a pretty good job of uh, making the histor history of this town more visible. Uh, we're into about three years now. I think it's this month we completed three years of publishing a monthly article in the uh, in the Gazette uh, about town history. Um, now there's two other articles being published. I think the whole notion of the history of this area is getting a little more attention. And I think we can take credit for, for some of that. Uh, we had success last this year with uh, creating a preservation code, helping to create the preservation code. Uh, the committee has now been formed to sort of uh, work on that. Um, uh, a logo resolution was passed to consider how to uh, modernize and, and correct some of the errors in our in our old logo, at least possibly. Um, and the uh, uh, so I think the work we've done has uh, has been beneficial for the town. Um, the uh, 
big change is the, the three thousand in, in terms of the budget is just that three thousand uh, dollars. We have the logo committee has started meeting, and we do have a graphic designer who is on the committee or has met with the committee. Uh, I think she wants to join it, and we may be have a, ask for a resolution about that come sometime soon. Uh, but she's a professional graphic designer, and she gave us an estimate of what uh, a new logo might cost. Uh, she actually thought 2,500 might be enough, but she said, make it 3,000 just to be a little bit on the safe side. So that's where we are with that. If anybody has any questions, be happy to answer them. No, Dennis, thank you. You've been, you've done a great job and you're right. Your, your articles in the paper are very informative and uh, really sort of sh shed the light on the, the history of the town. So your intention is that this would be a one-time expense then in the budget for the graphic design. So, so we can get the logo right this time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I yeah, hope so with everybody to, on the committee, you'll get it right. <laughs> it tended to be a one one shot deal. Yeah. Don't do. Do we even know how we got the logo that we had in the past? Uh, 1976. Uh, town resident, whose name escapes me right now, he's no longer in the town. Designed it as part of the bicentennial celebration at the time. Yeah. Okay. And Are we going to be getting drafts as at the board level, if you will, or um, ideas or choices, or you're just going to come with one logo out of this committee? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Actually, it certainly will be up to the town board to make the final decision. Uh, we plan on reaching out to uh, you know, groups within the town, get opinions about uh, uh, what should be on the logo? Uh, I talked to the um, uh, the chair of the comprehensive plan committee. They're planning on doing a an outreach to ask people about what 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 do they think of the town? What what ideas? Um, what what are their ideas for what the town represents and who the town should was and who the town what the town should become. Um, so we're going to work with the Comprehensive Plan Committee to get uh, feedback from the public about uh, what might be um, the right thing to put into, into a new logo. And then we'll come down to a series of choices and maybe the committee will make a decision and that'll put it up to uh, the town board to decide whether to go with that or not. Okay. Well, yeah. I think maybe you could even get some input from the board members, you know, when you get to yes. down to several choices, that yeah. sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. No, I just meant the final decision certainly would be up to. Yes. The yes. But yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think at least for myself, I'd like to sort of see some of the process, if yes. you will. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're certainly welcome to come to our meetings. <laughs> Lots of meetings. I know you don't have enough meetings to go to already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Hmm? No. no, I don't have any. He said we didn't introduce you. Oh, <laughs> Dennis Brennan. Thank you. Dennis with one N. Town historian. Town historian, yes. Thank you. Sorry. You have that. a title. That's all right. You have a title. I should have introduced right. myself, yeah. All right. Any other right. questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All good. Okay, so if you, oh, turn that. All right. So scrolling down, uh, we're going to start looking at revenues by fund. We'll start with the A fund revenues, which begin on page eighteen. Sorry. Okay. Um, so much uh, as we did with the expenditure side, on the revenue side, we also looked at actuals. So our, expen our revenues, like our expenditures, are based on what we've seen over the last um, four plus years, um, where we think we are with that, and um, a certain amount of forecasting that we've done based on conversations with our fiscal advisors for one and, and several other folks just to kind of make sure that we're not completely off sideways on anything. Um, one of the first ones that is a guess, so I will say it is a guess, is the, uh, the county sales tax. I had left that alone initially because we don't have the actual number. Um, I'm looking at 
probably, um, if I don't have an actual number from the county, by the time we're shifting um, towards the preliminary budget, I'm thinking probably about a 9% increase from what we've been hearing from the Office of the State Comptroller. Sales tax revenues have been up for roughly 12% across the state. Um, I like to be conservative. Um, I'd like better numbers from the county, but uh, barring having actual numbers, my, I plan to put 9% in there, which is probably low. I tend to put low on the revenue side, high on the expenditure side. I am a very conservative person. Um, I'm always happy, happy to have conversations about that, though, if anybody's interested. So can we go back up to real property tax, the first line? You uh, yeah, that's usually what I do last. I usually do all the other revenues first and then subtract that from the appropriations to give you what that number looks like. So that's kind of how I do my math, but go ahead. Well, um, again, we're talking about increases and I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. 4 million, 9, 5 million, 4, 9, now 6.1. Yep. How did we get to that number? We took the appropriations. We subtracted out what we think our actual revenues are. We subtracted out what we would be pulling potentially from fund balance. And that was what remained. So this is based on using the expenditures, which if you'll look are significantly, uh, the revenues rather, which are significantly down across the board. I um, have de decreased those. I think they've been overstated in a lot of sections. Uh, we no longer have the significant ARPA funds that we had the previous year, and this does reflect using some fund balance down at the bottom. So as you look through these several pages, that's you're, how we get to that number. I guess I'm, I'm not, this is what you're budgeting for, 6.1. Is that right? Right now, yes. Okay. Yes, that also includes no bonding. And that's why we have, we're having this as decisions, right? So by increasing all of our appropriations uh, by roughly the $2 million that were typically bonded across all the equipment lines, we've rolled all that back into the budget. So that obviously increases our appropriations a significant amount uh, by not bonding. So that, that, that's where you start with the math, right? So first you figure out what, what does it cost us to run the town? And that's, that's what we've been discussing with all these department heads over the last several days. Here is what they think they need to run their departments, um, which is mostly sufficient bar a few people who are unhappy with salaries. Um, then we take those numbers, are that appropriations line, and then we say, okay, that's how much we, we are planning to spend. Now, how do we get that on the revenue side? Um, the taxes come last when you're doing that calculation. So you start with your pilots because those are written down. We know how much we're getting in the pilots. That number was decided by someone else. That is just what it is. We don't get to have a say in that. It's, it's already a contract. Um, Non-property tax items, that gets into uh, franchise fees. We do that based on agreements that are already in place and what we're seeing. Um, some of those are currently being renegotiated. We're a little conservative on that. I'm thinking it'll probably be better than that. All these numbers, again, we will revisit now that we're a little further through the year and make sure that these are as accurate as possible. Um, and that's where the county sales tax number, I, I need a real number from the county. I, I don't know what they've gotten. I hazard you a guess. You probably won't get it. I agree with your statement there, but I, I do my best guessing. So, and that's what I work with, right? So I... I try to be conservative. And then as we went down through all the, as you go through the various departmental income, we looked at actual revenues over the last few years. Um, sometimes we think, yeah, what was budgeted in there previously makes sense. Sometimes it didn't. So some of them you'll see look the same and some have dropped. Um, very rarely do they go up. Uh, unfortunately, that is what we've seen as the case for reality. Um, I'm a realist. That's what I'm working with here. So when you go through these lines. Um, well, and back to the, you've also taken into consideration, you, obviously you've talked to the assessor and certain larger properties that may be looking to have their assessments adjusted. So um, that doesn't factor in here yet. That factors in with the actual rates when we get to that page. So that, that is a whole different page of the budget. That is what we do. Once we know how much we need to raise in taxes, we take that amount and we work with what the actual assessed valuation across the town is. 
The good news is that the residential assessed value did increase from uh, year to year. The commercial value dropped considerably based on all the different grievances and court cases. So our net was a small increase, but not considerable. So that's another consideration. That's what's going to actually affect the final rate at the end of it. But the amount of taxes to be raised is purely based on what do we want to spend and what do we think we're actually getting in. Right. So but you're explaining it very well, taking those things into consideration. Okay. So, and, and again, I will tell you, I am, I am very conservative. I am probably putting our revenues a bit lower than we'll see, but I would rather do that than overstate them. Um, I, it's, that's something that I think about deeply. Um, there are a few things here that I've noted um, for myself um, where I think we need to make some increases. For example, as I had mentioned before, the yard waste disposal fee, I think we need to increase it from $55 to $58 for those folks who opt in. Uh, if we do that, I think it will uh, cover the cost of the program adequately. Um, the other Does, thing... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Beth. Does the amount that you have budgeted there, the three hundred seventy-one thousand, that includes the fifty-eight dollars? That is, if we increase it to fifty-eight dollars, and that's based okay. on the number of parcels that typically do opt in, and that differential. And if we kept it at fifty-five dollars, it would be last year's. Uh, it would be three hundred fifty-five. Hold 000. on, I can tell you what it would be if it was at fifty-five dollars. The amount would instead be roughly three hundred fifty-two thousand. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Excel is my friend. Okay. Um, for the landfill coupons and fees, um, this is where I had said there, if we wish to keep um, that transfer station open and continue offering that service, unfortunately, it has become much more expensive for the town to do that. And we're seeing a lot fewer residents actually using it. So the combination is almost a double whammy on that. We did some calculations upstairs. And what we were looking at there, um, for the yearly pass price, uh, we were we think it would have to go up to $130 a year. Um, that is a considerable increase from what it is currently. Um, for a one day, it would go to $45 a day, and for the three day to $90. Those are significant increases. However, um, based on what trash and recycling haulers charge right now, the cheapest rate going there is $19 a month, which it, so for a resident to have a trash and recycled haul would be $228 yearly. So even at the $130 yearly price, it's still considerable savings for a resident who would want to bring um, their trash and recycling to the transfer stations. So it's it is a significant increase over our current rates, but it is still less for a resident to do that than it would be for them to hire the service to their house. Something that I think the board really needs to think about. Um, this is where the hard decisions come in, right? If we don't want to have the taxes go up. Right now, we've been carrying with general fund taxes a good portion of the cost of the transfer station. Um, so people across the town are paying whether or not they're using the services. This would shift this more to the people who are using those services, and that's a decision the board needs to consider. Um, we have added a small line um, to pass through the cost of the school tax billing, printing, and the postage for those um, since we do the school tax collection. Um, that's something we had not been doing previously. So we're going to be billing the school system for that? Is that your intention? It's a pass-through, yes. We typically, municipalities typically do that. When we do conduct services for one another, we pass through the costs of that. That's not unusual. We've never done it here. Uh, so I've heard. <laughs> I'm not saying I disagree with it. I just... No, I, I. there are many things that I've found that we've never done here or haven't done the way that I think is usual, but... That's all open for conversation. Um, we did build a school this year. They said fine and paid us. So they didn't seem to mind overly. Um, Maybe we didn't charge them enough. Probably not. <laughs> um, one of the things that you'll see um, that is going to go up further, which I'm happy to say, is the interest that we're starting to earn on our use of money and property across the various funds. 
um, with the increases we're seeing, um, our, our money is making money for us again, which we're very happy about. Um, I have the numbers that you have in front of you are based on what we saw for actuals in August. I've updated them uh, on my spreadsheet as I'm kind of working ahead into the preliminary budget based on the September numbers, we've seen considerable increases. I'll update those yet again in October um, with the multiple increases we've seen at the Fed level. Um, it's something that we're, we're pretty pleased our interest is actually starting to go back up to where we had had it in years past, um, which is great for making money. It's very bad for bonding, right? So those are those balances. Well, we weren't making any money on our investments. We were able to bond at very, very low costs for things. It made sense. Now the reverse is completely true. This is so now is the time to roll costs back into the budget and not bond. And yet the interest we have out there is actually we're increasing the rates that we're receiving um, revenues on that. So a lot of this is just um, managing our cash flow. And once we know what we've got and when we need it across the, the year, we invest accordingly. So Luckily for us as a town, we get the vast majority of our income right at the very beginning of the year with our tax bills. We're able to invest a large portion of that across the year because we only use it in, you know, we, we don't need all of it in the first half a year. Um, so we can invest over time and make more money on our money. So, um, there we had a fairly significant uh, decrease in uh, what I revenue um, line is the under the licensing and permits, the 2555 building alteration permits. Um, we've seen that drop off considerably. Most of that I think has to do with the increased cost of construction and the supply chain constraints, but we have decreased that considerably um, as we go down through those lines. Additionally, for the fines and forfeitures in uh, the next section down, A0026, um, the courts are are seeing that there is a lot less revenue coming through the court system. Courts are never meant to be a revenue producer. That is not their purpose, but it is something that we account for in our budgets. Um, we have removed the uh, sale of real property. There is no property that the town is currently intending to sell, so there's no reason to have that amount accounted for as a revenue. There are a number of miscellaneous revenues in there um, based on what we've seen. And uh, for example, with the AIM, we actually have gotten the email from the Office of the State Comptroller in September, so we know what that amount actually is. Uh, those have been put in accordingly. But can you go back? What what was that uh, property that was potentially going to be for sale? That is a mystery to me. Oh. Was that the property adjacent to the rec center and the pool maybe? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I apologize. I, have, I just don't have history. So that's I, the only one I can think of off the top of my head, which then you have worked on with our planner. So that might be it, Jamie. I, it's the only thing I can think of. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, moving down to state aid. Um, the mortgage tax, we think, is uh, holding fairly steady at this point. We're happy with where that is. Um, this is where you'll see in the New York State Records Management Grant, we've got the $40,000 to match the um, $40,000 that Michelle was talking about for the record storage system. And then you'll see further down, we have increased the uh, other public safety line to $40,610. That's to match uh, the costs of our discovery clerk and assorted things um, because those are all fully reimbursable still. So that offsets those costs. The other public safety grant under federal aid is the COPS grant that had been applied for. And if you'll recall, there were two additional positions that were contingent on that grant for hiring that Jordan had mentioned. For 
the general fund, um, we do need to, let's see, I, I, we've had some adjustment on the um, inner fund transfers for the drainage districts uh, and the parks district. I'm not sure why, but the inner fund transfers from the drainage districts, the actual amount um, that's budgeted for those districts has not changed. I'm not sure why that number was different last year. It, I guess that's all I can really say to that. It is, it's accounted for further on in the budget when you look through the, the drainage districts. And the parks, parks districts had stayed the same. Okay, were there any questions on the A fund revenues? If not, we can scroll down to the highway fund revenues. Thank you. I think it's twenty six, isn't 26, it? Twenty six, I'm 26, sure. Twenty six, yeah. Yep. All right. That's good. All right. Um, again, we're seeing interest starting to climb up there. I'll be making a further adjustment on that line. Uh, you'll see the permit fees for the licenses and permits have increased with all the work that's been done recently. The rest of them are fairly um, straightforward for the state aid um, chips and so forth. Um, that was um, according to the letter that we received in April that we're anticipating that to stay the same slightly decreased but it's overall it's it's not much of a change and you'll see again that the ARPA funds have fallen off at this point anybody have any question on the highway fund revenues okay we can keep going down to the sewer one <laughs> Thank you. You did. Okay. All right. Sorry, my scrolling is a little slow on this computer. Okay, so for revenues for sewer one, um, I'm trying to see again, we've, we're seeing the interest starting to come back up. We've got an increase in the sale of equipment. Um, that's a portion of the uh, closed circuit TV truck and the 10 wheel dump chassis. Uh, what we expect, we're seeing really good resale value right now on equipment when we put that up. So um, we feel that that'll be reasonable for, for the sale of those two items. And those will be apportioned across both sewer and the water fund. Are we having an increase in the rates there? So this is where I was talking about sewer one has never had a utility billing before. It's always been just lumped all the operations and maintenance plus the capital debt all onto the tax bill. So this you'll see that the um, tax bill only reflects the capital debt for that particular system. And then the operations and maintenance cost will be billed out as a utility bill. Um, that's one of the reasons we're working to correct which Properties are in the correct districts at this point. So we have the proper district um, counts for the number of units that are in each of the districts so that we can correctly figure the rates once we separate out all of that information. We will have those. We don't yet. It's a process. And I will go on record as saying counting is hard. 
the uh, the water and sewer uh, billing systems, the assessor system, and what we had in our office all counted all three districts and none of our numbers matched. So we are doing a very extensive deep dive at this point to ensure that we have absolutely the correct numbers before we determine the rates because we'd like it to be right. I will say, however, I think the assessor is starting to hide from me. So, not really. I just give him a hard time. All right. If you don't have any questions on sewer one revenues, we can go down to sewer six. Okay. Again, you'll see the interest, um, it's coming up. It'll be coming up a little bit more. We've got the uh, sale of equipment. You'll see a significant increase. Again, that's that portion of the closed circuit TV truck and the 10 wheel dump chassis. Um, we are pretty confident that the rest of the numbers are where they should be. Um, of note, the septage fees, you'll see at 250, that is still an estimate. However, it is based on a signed contract. Um, from my conversations with Matt, I think this number is actually a little bit conservative. Um, and we will be adjusting that slightly based on what we start seeing. I will probably leave it low this initial year because we don't want to overstate that until we actually see significant delivery and processing and see where we should be with that. I'm hoping that this is a nice low number and that it will increase next year. Any questions on the sewer six revenues? Bless you. All right. If there are none, we can go down to water. Just 41. Thank you very much. Page 41. So on these recommendations that you have here for, for rents, mm -hmm. you're anticipating an increase, correct? In the fee yeah, due to CPI and increased so, costs and. Yep. That is based uh, on, on the cost. So based when you go over to that appropriation side, that is what that is directly tied to. So what will actually go on to the tax bill will be the debt service, cumulative debt service for that, and that is that top number, the 987, 120, and 46 cents. Um, that's going to be the portion that goes out on all the, on the taxes for the water um, debt service. And then the O&M is the remaining basically 3.9 million that it costs to run the water system. I do expect, again, the interest rates to go, um, earnings to be a little bit higher. They're starting to creep up already, so we're expecting that to come up a little bit more. We have dropped uh, the permit fees for meters based on what we're seeing historically. Um, we felt 12 was a bit high this past year, and uh, I'll look at that again and readjust. The other number that's dropped a bit is the water penalty, the penalties for water rents. Um, They've been kind of all over the map. We were shooting a little bit more for the middle. We're going to take another look at that and see if that's too low or if that needs to come up a bit more. Substantial difference, right? 2027,000, 2021, 31. Yeah. I mean, it's 4,000, then it's 23, then it's seven, then it's 31. I mean, it's very hard to nail It's that very down. hard to kind of, and that's where we were looking across averages on that. So now that we're a little further along in this year, we should have a better idea as this last um, billing cycle goes out. Any other questions on the water revenues? 
If not, we're going to just go down and we'll kind of walk through the drainage districts. So we really haven't made any significant changes to these. They cost basically uh, what they cost each year. It's it's done a little strangely, and this is why this is one of the things that um, we're talking between the um, um, highway department, the assessor's office, and mine on how we're managing drainage districts. This was one along with lighting districts that we really think it would make more sense to consolidate these and roll them into other budget lines that are like we have drainage in our main budget in a couple different places, and then we have these other ones separated out. Um, if you look at it systemically, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, and if you look at how these are done, basically we take the money and then we just transfer it over to the general fund to spend it anyway. So it's, it's a little bit odd the way these are managed and it does cause just another layer of complexity where I don't think that's completely necessary. Uh, that's something we'd like to have further consideration going forward on how we manage it. Any question on any of the drainage districts? If not, we've got the lighting districts following that. Well, we have lighting districts one through nine with the exception of two. I don't know why there's no lighting district two, but there is not. I'm sure there is, there is a reason. Again, there's no changes really with regard to the cost of the lighting districts. Uh, we've made some small adjustments for the increase price in electricity um, that we think should be reasonable. We took the uh, actual costs um, as of July 22 and we doubled it and did a small increase on top of that just to keep up with the rising cost in electricity. Um, that still actually looks like we decreased the budget for them. I'm not sure why it had been quite as high as it was previously. Beyond that, we have the parks districts, and these are for the little pocket parks throughout the town. And they start on page 48. And they wrap up the budget, with page 48 and 49. We did decrease a number of these as we felt that the, the amounts that had been raised were a bit much um, for the various parks. Uh, we've tried to put them a little closer to what they actually are. Um, both the drainage districts and the park districts do have a fair amount of fund balance associated with those specific things that have to be kept with them. Um, so if an expense were to come up, we would have uh, a way to cover that. So I'm comfortable with where we've put these numbers. And that is all of the budget at this point. Um, so with that in mind, um, Based on comments that we've had over the course of these discussions, I've already been working on the preliminary budget uh, that, that the board will have. Um, we'll make sure that it's filed by the 19th with the clerk. Um, I'll get preliminary drafts of it. Well, drafts of the preliminary, I should say, to the board before that, just to start looking at where we're increasing the revenue from interest, where we've made the adjustments based on the comments. Um, anytime there was a, you know, the $3,000 in one line for Ray, I made note of that. If we've made any changes, I've made note of that. Um, they've been rolled into this. I'm still uh, adjusting things based on, especially the revenue side, um, re-looking at where we are based on this far through the year, just to be a little bit more accurate. And I'll continue to do that as we go forward. Um, so this gets back to the actual decisions for the board, right? We said there were basically three decisions in order to not raise the taxes significantly. It's either to cut the services, to cut down those appropriations, um, 
where we've rolled the equipment back into the costs. You can pull it out and bond for it. I would advise strongly against that. I've done a lot of work with our fiscal advisors this week. Um, with the current interest rates, we're seeing um, a $2 million bond for the equipment would end up costing us nearly an additional, at, at least based on current rates, and this isn't rates in six months when we would actually do the bonding, would be another almost $700,000 over the life of repaying that for $2 million worth of equipment, which I think is, is not a good idea. Um, and the other option is to use additional fund balance um, to keep the taxes down. I think given the options, I think that is your best bet as a board. I think it's something you should seriously consider. Um, specifically with regard to the highway fund balance, we are in excess of our own town policy on what we should be carrying in that fund balance. We have to either use some of it to bring the tax rate down. Um, fund balance is tax dollars, right? It's taxes that were raised previously that for whatever reason weren't fully expended and rolled into that fund balance. So now they're here to be used either to set up the reserve or to keep the tax rates lower currently. Um, now would be a good time to do that, I think. Um, it's a good use of the money um, with that and with the ability to do some thoughtful investing. I think we can keep our fund balance healthy even while we use a little bit of it. Um, we've had a lot of discussions upstairs in our office, and we've been working a lot in the last few weeks with our fiscal advisors on trying to come up with a plan on how we do this well and how we are good fiduciary stewards of the town funds. Um, and we do think that this is a good time to use fund balance to keep the tax rate low and then to do some significant investing to make sure that we can grow our interest at a high enough rate to replenish that fund balance that we've used. Um, so at this point, I will say if you have any questions for me, I'm open to questions. What would it look like if we used additional fund balance? At this point, I think uh, once I tweak the revenues, I think you could actually use slightly less fund balance out of general fund. I think we could take that down to about 300,000 out of general. And I think I would push the highway use up to about 2 million of highway fund balance. Um, I'll play with those numbers and I'll get them out to the board to show, but that would get us almost to a flat um, rate on the tax. So we'd see almost no increase. It would be very, very small. Um, I think that would be considerable. Uh, the highway, even even if we took two million out of the highway fund, we're still over. We'd still have to set up a reserve. We've got that much highway fund balance. There's right that now. much in there. There is that, that much in question. there. Yes. So even using that much. Even using that much. Um, so that's something that um, I, I need to crunch some numbers too as we're working on the water and sewer rates, on whether or not to use a little bit of water and sewer fund balance against those equipment purchases to keep those O and M costs down so that the water and sewer rates stay low. I don't know what that looks like yet, and that's something I'll be working on over the next week um, just to make sure. Our goal here is to make sure that we're managing things in such a way that we're covering the costs of everything. We're still finding ways to, to rebuild those fund balances without depleting them, but we also don't want to, as we restructure the way we're doing the billing for water and sewer to be better in compliance with state requirements and law, we don't want to cause it to be a huge impact on the taxpayers. It's already going to be different than what they're used to seeing. We don't want it to be a significant increase as well as a different way of doing it. Um, so we're working very hard to make sure that we do this correctly and do it well and thoughtfully. Hmm. Beth, just to confirm, using fund balance to uh, alleviate the tax increase is an approved mm -hmm. method or approved it practice is. by Actually, the comptroller's it's, office? It's one of the two things that our own fund balance policy recommends. It says when we have... Um, it right here. I thought I had it. Yeah, so right here it specifically says it's for both general and highway, but it says if the balance of the highway fund exceeds 25% of the budgeted appropriations, the chief fiscal officer of the town of Nisku will recommend that all or a portion thereof be transferred either to a capital improvement reserve fund, which we would need to establish, used for one-time expenditures that are non-recurring which would be, the, the equipment are kind of in that line, especially for the larger pieces in the highway, mm. um, to reduce the debt principal or dependence, or three, to reduce the property tax levy. So by our own policy, those are the recommended uses. So yes, it would very much and fall And also recommended by the state comptroller, though, I believe, correct? It is actually, yes. And there, there is no hard and fast rule um, in terms of the state comptroller's office on how much fund balance you should carry, although they have a rule of thumb that you don't want to be more than 
30%. Our town policy is a little more stringent. It says 25%. Um, so either way, we're, we're, we're well in excess of that. So we do want to, we want to pull that down just a little bit. Those fund balances are basically meant to be more of a rainy day fund. Mm -hmm. um, the goal, unlike so many other aspects of budgeting at the municipal level, our goal is always to be even, right? We don't want to raise more taxes than what we spend. But again, we're always doing a certain amount of educated guessing, right? So we try to be conservative on, on our revenues. We try to be a little bit, you know, guess a little high on our expenditures. So inevitably, if we're doing our job well, it's close to zero, but there's always going to be a little differential. So in case we guess poorly and we're, we, under collect a little bit, we'd get a little less revenue. We have a little bit of fund balance to cushion us if we need it, but we don't want to over connect, over collect. But if we do and we get a little extra fund balance, then we kind of should be using that to, we don't want to take in more money from the taxpayers than we need to. Right. Right. So but that's like you the said, goal. I mean, fund balance is money we've already collected through taxes. Absolutely. So essentially by using it to lower the tax increase, we're, we're returning it to, to the, the taxpayers. taxpayers. Exactly. Right? More. So it's alleviating the increase based on money we've already raised by taxpayer dollars. Exactly. Yeah. All the money we work with is all the taxpayers' money, right? Right. It's not my money. Well, it's my tax money, but yes, it's <laughs> it's not. We, we we say that a lot to the department heads too. It is not your money. It, it's the taxpayers' money. So, right. it, but our, our job is to manage it well. So, any other right. question? And to your point, managing it well, and there is a portion that you want to continue to keep in your fund balance because yes. if you got down to where you had a zero fund balance that's that would not not be a place well. you want to be correct and at one point i don't know when this was but the, the state was sort of pushing that right that they didn't want municipalities to have fund balances carried over and then they saw the wisdom and that wasn't so good so it was okay have some fund balance and they gave you a figure of 30 that, that's the kind of the rule of thumb ish. They don't, they don't put it down, but that's no, generally, but that's a lot. It is. Well, it's 30% of whatever your annual appropriations are for that given fund. Right. And that's why our town is only 25% of the annual appropriation. So, right. Um, yeah. And again, at this point we're using fund balance for non reoccurring expenses. As you said, instead yes. of bonding, instead of bonding, you have the money used right. to use it to buy that, truck that's going to plow the roads and last 20 years. Right. Yeah. Beth, can I ask a question? Absolutely. We had a couple of department heads speak to salaries. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit about who got yeah, salary so increases, all, how that works? Yeah, I sure can. I, I sent out an email earlier that showed the non-rev salary schedule um, after the conversation of if we were to give. So our initial budget that we put down here mm -hmm. um, for the tentative budget did only had um, increases reflected for the people who were in a union. So the non-revs did not get one with a couple of small exceptions. Um, the, the town attorney, we did have an increase for, um, we had an increase within the supervisor's office. We had a small increase, um, within two positions in the planning department in case we want to promote those people based on their job description to another job description, which would then move their salary schedule a little bit. So those were built in, um, but the remainder of all the non-representative, which is typically the middle management, so all your working crew leaders across the water and sewer funds and the highway funds, and then across the, all the department heads, there were no, um, there was no cost of living built in to that. Um, like the unions all generally get roughly a 2% cost of living in addition to any step increases or longevity increases that they had. So that's where we were with the initial budget. Additionally, none of the part-time employees had increases factored in, which is both of the offices this afternoon who were discussing about um, where they feel that salaries should go up. Both were with regard to part-time employees. And did you work on some estimates for uh, those non-admin? I did. So um, based on the comment that... Um, was made previously about what would it cost to do a 2% raise for the non-representatives. Uh, it would be about $68,000. I think what was it? 68487 I think off the top of my head, something like that, um, across the entire town to give a 2% cost of living adjustment to all of the non-represented full-time employees. But that still does not address the part-time employees. 
So that's where if, um, if you want to look at uh, certain positions within part-time employment, uh, I can do up estimates for what it would cost to change, it, you know, by, it would depend on what, what amount would, would be applied and so forth. So most of our part-time employees make somewhere less than $20 an hour. So an increase would be, I don't know, it would depend on how many hours they work and so forth. So that's kind of a case by case basis for me to actually do the math on it. Do we know when the last time any of these part-time employees received an increase was? I can look. We, it, it was Was that across the whole town, or was that like certain people? You know, for a while they were doing um, virtual. <laughs> I think you had to do the one at the base first. It is. It really is. So for a for a long time they were doing. Um, if the non-rep full-times got 2%, they were giving the part-timers 2%. And then it changed, if I had to guess, 2018, 2019. Um, they started doing like a quarter. Everybody, all the part-timers got a quarter. And then it kind of went on a case-by-case -case basis. And then I think for one or two years, um, they didn't get any increase. The same years that we didn't, the, the full-timers didn't get the increase. Bear with me because I have to jump between two monitors. Okay, I think we need more information on that, um, to, in you know, to educate us, right? Mm -hmm. The board members get some figures on part-time and non-represented numbers so that it gives us information to work with, right? Okay. Yeah, as I start putting together the draft of the preliminary, I'll make some adjustments and I'll note, I'll highlight and put notes out in the side on what I've, what I've done and, and why, and that way you'll be able to look at whether that's something you'd like to entertain going forward or not. Well, yeah, again, in the past, sometimes what's happened is we've done the budget and then that, um, those things have come up, you know, in December or right. January. And if we can try to work with it now, I think that's a better practice. It's nicer to plan for things. Yes, it yeah, it'd be nice to have a plan for like yearly. So we're not looking, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's been five years. Now in two years, we're doing this. And now we're doing a quarter and all these different. Right. Yeah. So in 2020, they got an increase. In 2021, they did not. And then in 2022, based on what I'm looking at, the one person I'm looking at, there was um, no increase from 2020. So from... They've basically been the same since 2020. Beth, will you make a note to look at that and identify some possible numbers to make those increases? Thank you. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Would we be doing that from the fund balance if we... No, no, that wouldn't be from fund balance. That's overall. Uh, so there'll be a lot of adjusting across the board with, I've got some revenues that are going to come up. We've probably got some expenses that are going to come up. We're going to kind of balance everything out. So that's uh, my plan is if, if you would like for it, and it's what I'm hearing is that everybody's kind of interested in rather than bonding or, or diminishing services, using some of that fund balance. What I'll do is I'll take that as my homework. I'll go back into here and I'll get a draft uh, budget put together for the preliminary that reflects that and kind of I'll try to capture what I've heard and then I will send it um, with an email that says here's all the changes I've made here's what we've got and I'll get it out to all the board members to look at and then you can kind of give me feedback and we can go back and forth a few times um, kind of an iterative process so I make sure that I'm understanding you and that I'm getting everything that you all want in there before we file that as uh, the preliminary budget um, by the 19th of this month with the town clerk. And then that will be the budget that is up for the public discussion at the end of the month. Right. So. And just sort of the, the way that it works, and we've run into this in, in the past. So that's the preliminary budget that gets submitted to the town clerk. Sometimes we might call it the supervisor's budget, okay? And then there's still 
time for us to have open discussions on right. the budget and make changes. Absolutely. That are agreed upon by the board, make changes, and then we get to a final budget. And if the board doesn't come to a decision on the final budget, okay, by default, it goes back to the preliminary budget, which would be preliminary or supervisor's budget that was submitted to the town clerk. So that's the mechanics. That That's how right. it works. Yeah. So if there's some disagreements and we can't get a quorum on the budget, it goes to the preliminary budget becomes the town budget. And, and that's part of what I think is good about doing this in the way that this has been done with the conversation is hopefully we've captured everybody's thoughts uh, and we can get them all incorporated so that that budget is, is much more of a thoughtful budget that everybody's got um, some input into so that everybody kind of knows where it is. And if we've got questions um, during this iterative process, I'd like to answer those um, and make sure that we're capturing everything. Okay. Okay. Well, we haven't discussed the elected salaries and I think that's okay. Something worth discussing here tonight. Oops, my apologies. Those were on page. They're just following the last page of the parks districts um, per the requirement by the state. Those are listed out specifically. Um, the only change was, um, as previously mentioned this evening, within the supervisor's budget. Um, the, of note, the uh, town supervisor's salary has not changed in over 20 years. So there was a small increase put in there. So I, I want to speak to that. I spoke to the prior supervisor about this um, three years ago mm -hmm. and said that as a board for the town residents, we need to look at that. We need to look at the supervisor's position and the work that the supervisor does for this town and the salary level. And I, I was unsuccessful in getting the prior supervisor to to look at that. And now we have a new supervisor that is willing to look at that. We have a town with a budget over what's the grand total of the budget? Around twenty seven million. Twenty seven million dollars. Two hundred probably plus employees in this town, and we have a Chief Executive, Chief Financial Officer, making $58,500. You would never find anyone in the private industry who would take on that kind of task for that level. And people say, oh, but it's a part-time position. Well, in the past, what's sort of developed with this supervisor's position is it really isn't a part-time position. It's really developed into a full-time job of 30 hours or more a year. Um, so I, again, approached the prior supervisor. Didn't want to do anything. I spoke to our current supervisor, Jamie Pucciani, about this. And I think she gave it a lot of consideration. <clears throat> I think she has a lot of courage of bringing this forward and bringing it to the board's attention. And I think it's important for this board to really consider this and this is something that we need to do for the residents of the town we need to look at the salary level especially of the supervisor of the town and maybe some of these other positions here also right now we have in front of us um, an increase for the supervisor's position mm -hmm. and our, our residents expect the supervisor to be there for them all mm -hmm. the time it's just what they expect. When they pick up the phone, they call the supervisor's office. They may get the supervisor's secretary, but <clears throat> they expect a call back or some attention from the supervisor of the town. And as you said, Beth, 20 years, it's been over 20 years, this has not changed. And there's never a good time, right? There's never a good time for an elected official to increase their salary. Um, we've got okay, COVID, then we've got, okay, now we've got inflation. What's going to be next? It's a recession. Is there ever a good time? Never really, never really a good time. But we're not, in my mind, doing the taxpayer's job, if you will, that they elected us here 
to do if we're not <clears throat> considering this and putting a map forward to get the salary of the supervisor more commensurate with the duties that the job entails. And making a small increase this year, I think is a step forward in doing that. And I think that we should continue it every year until we get it to a level that the board decides really is commensurate with the amount of work that the supervisor of the town in this unit does and is responsible for. So that's sort of my feeling on this. And again, it's, it's not a Democrat, it's not a Republican, it's not a political decision. This is the decision for the taxpayers of Niskayuna to make sure that the town of Niskayuna runs efficiently and will also, in the future, give them a better, maybe not better, but more of an open pool of candidates that might want to become the supervisor of our town when we're all gone from here, right? You know, nobody's here, here forever, as they say, and we need to really look at that. And I think it's, it's well over time to do it. I agree to, to add to that. It's not just a full-time job. It's a 24 seven job. The supervisor is on call for all emergencies at any time. 365. And um, I think it would be good to be able to attract candidates who weren't just retired or independently wealthy, who didn't have to take a second job in order to um, fill their financial obligations to their families. I think it would be an equity issue. So anyone could apply and not have to work a second job. And not a lot of people can do it. And Supervisor Puccioni is doing an amazing job working a full-time job and a part-time job. But as a resident of Niskayuna, I personally feel like I don't want my supervisor to feel like they have to have a side gig. <laughs> I'd like them to be able to feel professionally respected and adequately um, compensated and not have to worry about being questioned about her time. That's a 24-7 job. Going back. Are you, can I say uh, one yes, more thing? Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> Going back to the monetary aspect of this, I think it's 40, 4,700. It is. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So last year we had a deputy supervisor that the previous supervisor increased that salary. And there were, so we've got about what, 3000 or $3,500 from that because Jessica is the deputy supervisor at a thousand and the prior Deputy supervisor was at 40, 4,500. So thank you. So that's $3,500 that can really go to this. From the supervisor mm -hmm. budget. Right. And this, this raises the supervisor's salary to be above the lowest paid employees mm -hmm. and the department heads. And I don't think you'd have to look anywhere in, in America and find us. CEO of a company that got paid less than the people they're supervising by, by a lot. So it just makes a lot of sense going forward, finding good candidates, making it more equitable and open. So I'm in agreement with this. Bill, you had said earlier that we're here to do what the taxpayers have elected us to do. And in my opinion, that's to be their voice, uh, to fairly represent them. Um, and listen to what they say. Uh, I don't think any of us here ran for office to make money. I think we all did it because we want to make the town a better place. Um, I think rather than putting money in our pockets, we need to listen to the department heads that spoke today. Um, this is a, a year of record inflation, and I think we need to fight to take care of our town employees who have made a career here, and we need to fight to put money back in our taxpayers' pockets. And I think that's where the money needs to go right now. Um, if the concern here is getting more qualified candidates down the road, which I understand, then uh, let's do that in an election year. But I think right now we need to take care of our town employees. We need to take care of our residents and, and put the money in their pockets. No, and I agree that we need to take care of our residents and, and put money in their pockets. And sometimes when you're elected to a public position, you have to be forward thinking, right? We can't go year to year to year. And when Beth and Jamie came in, 
I said to them, I, I want, yeah, I, we need to look at five year projections. We have to get more long term thinking. And that's sort of, you know, I like to think long term. And Jamie at least has the courage to put this forward to be thinking of long term thinking. It's a very, it's nominal. Again, budgeting wise, we got $3,500 on the deputy line back. It's 4,700. It's a very small increase. And I don't really see it as putting money in, in, in our pockets. I think if we were doing this on an entire board level, saying that we wanted not only an increase for the supervisor, but the town council people, the town clerk, the receiver, all across the board, I would be more in agreement with you that that would be more of, okay, everybody putting money in their pocket. This is really an issue about this position and really trying to get this position where it should be. And we're starting with a small incremental step in doing that. It's it, really, this is a, this job is over a hundred thousand dollar a year job. Now that's just my opinion. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I certainly wouldn't leave the jobs that I have to do the job of the supervisor of the town in Niskayuna. I don't know. W would you leave your job and, and, and do that for the salary level that it's at at this point in time? Most people can't afford yeah. that. I, I don't, I you know, you don't have to answer that, but I, mm -hmm. that's just my feeling and, and thinking on this. If, um, if you're asking me if I would leave my job to take the supervisor's position, whether I would or not, I would know the salary coming into it. And um, she did know the salary coming into it. Right? And, and again, she has the courage to put it forth. I spoke to the prior supervisor about <clears throat> the same thing and she didn't want to do it. So why would a board try to, put it forward if the current supervisor wasn't supportive of it. But now I mean, we I, have a person that is supportive of it and has the courage to say that. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. and, and I respect that also. And I do think it takes courage to, to bring this forward. Um, but like I said, I, I think a year of record inflation, when we hear from our own department heads that they're at risk of losing employees due to, um, due to their salary. Yeah, I just don't want to be short sighted. It's, I think it is short sighted. Like, like Bill said, we need to be more planful of what we pay across the whole town, especially the leader of our town, to make sure we're attracting candidates and being equitable for who can take this job. It shouldn't have to be someone who has to work a side job or someone who's retired or someone who's independently wealthy. I think our residents would like to see someone who could just devote their time and energy, since it is 24-7, mm -hmm. to them. I think it's also important to note that there are, they are in this salary or in this budget, important increases to employees' salaries. The town attorney, I have recommended she should receive a, sal a salary increase. She works incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. She's doing a great job. She reduced her private practice to come and work for the town and I felt it was important to put that forward. Also, in the planning and building department, we have our town planner who is working far outside of her job description, and it's important to put her in the proper job description and pay her in, in a way that is aligned with that job description that is in the budget. We have another member of the building department who is also working outside of his job description, according to civil service. He has taken his test. We have in the budget built in an increase to put him in the right position with the correct civil service title. So there are increases to salaries in this budget and they're appropriate. And I am fully supportive of looking at part-time employees who should have a raise. I'm also very supportive of a 2% COLA increase for non-represented people. But I do think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, we're talking about, did you come here to, uh, to serve the public? Yes. And over the last nine and a half months, that is exactly what I did. 
I came here to make things better, to fix things. In the first two and a half months in office, I led the way in solving the police retirement issue that had languished for over a decade. It took courage of conviction and I helped lead that charge. Now we have a police chief who is fully supported. The department is stable, morale is up. We have a new town attorney, a comptroller, working very well for the town. We have a wastewater treatment plant that had not been working to its potential. This year, we worked very hard to fulfill our obligation and sign contracts to start taking in organic waste. We fixed that. I help lead that way. Working with our partners to make sure we have businesses who are coming to our town, like Momentive, who are investing millions of dollars in building an infrastructure into our town, bringing jobs. Human resources. You yourself said human resources needed to be addressed when you were running for election. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first things I did was make sure to bring in an outside HR consulting firm to help revise our employee handbook, bring back order and structure and morale to town hall. These are all important things, writing grants to help fund projects that were languishing also, tennis courts that had to be locked and bolted because they were a safety issue. I, in nine and a half months, <clears throat> we have done a lot and I've helped lead that charge, but we have to think about the salary for this position and moving forward, how do we make sure to attract someone? Because right now, the only people who can run for this office or serve in this office are someone who's independently wealthy, on a pension, has a wealthy family. Maybe they have political party affiliation that can allow them to get employment at the county. I mean, or maybe it's someone like me who has a dual PhD and who can reduce her academic load to 50% and work part-time and make half of a salary to do the work, to do the service to this town. And I think it's very important for us to think about the future and plan for the future. This isn't necessarily about me. This is about the office of the supervisor and attracting candidates who don't have to have two careers who can afford to leave their career for two to four years, serve the town. And listen, if this is something we do now or we do later, maybe it's the right idea, but we're doing it at the wrong time. I am willing to have that discussion. I think opening it up to have the discussion is an important next step. I also think exploring a commission to analyze this position and identify and make a recommendation for an appropriate salary is something that is very important. And we can also do that. I, I firmly believe that's important. And whether or not this salary increase takes place now or in the future, when I leave office, the important thing is to be courageous and open the conversation. And I'm, I'm willing to do challenging things. That's why I took on the retirement issue and I solved it in 10 weeks in office when nobody would touch it for over a decade. No one's touched this in 20 years. <laughs> That's right. No change in the salary since 2003. Because, and if you compare it because to Because you get judged and you get backlash for it. Yeah. But so, it's, an important, it's important to look forward to. Well, as an elected official, as I said, yeah. never a good time, right? Never. And, but you have to have the courage and the fortitude to do really what is is right. So moving forward, I think we have to decide if it stays in what we keep in the preliminary budget, 
moving forward in the next week. And I think it's an ongoing conversation and it's something we should uh, continue to talk about and also uh, hear from constituents and, and the comptroller. I made a note. <laughs> And that was all I had, unless anyone has anything else. Timeline for the preliminary budget to us? I should have something out. Um, I'll plan to have it out to the full board on Friday. I'll, I'll make some adjustments tomorrow um, with my staff. We'll look at a bunch of things. And then we'll get an initial draft to everybody on Friday to look at over the weekend. And then if everybody can get comments back to me, um, hopefully sometime during the day on Monday, it does need to be filed by the 19th. So I just want to make sure that I'm meeting the proper deadlines. Um, that would be great. The 19th, that's when you file it. Yes. No, okay. That's a week from this Friday, right? The Wednesday, 19th is Wednesday. Wednesday. Thank you very much, Beth. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Beth. Thank you.